All right, welcome everybody. Today we have a very special training. I'm here with my friend, Brandon Young. How's it going, Brandon? Welcome, welcome. Gary, always good to see you, man. Thank you. Yes, I'm super excited to, to have you. Today we have Brandon Young giving a life master's class on the 2023 Amazon Prime Research. He's gonna walk you through a lot of the, the challenges, the questions that I've seen everybody have. And, um, you know, basically we're gonna leave no stone unturned. And I saw over a over hundred people signed up for this webinar. You know, you guys have told us you're struggling with, um, you know, not picking just popular things you like rather than what demand. Maybe you had one slow product, it was a disaster. You're almost ready to give up paying in there. Uh, product selection is the hardest thing. So, you know, if you're like, if you're like that, or, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, struggling choosing a product that's not oversaturated or, you know, even if you're already selling and, you know, so much has changed since the last time you launched and you want to know what current parameters are for to look out for, especially going into the new year, uh, definitely stick around today. So a quick intro of Brandon Young, in case you don't know him, Brandon is an eight-figure seller, so more than $25 million just on Amazon in 2022. He's a coach at Seller Systems, e-commerce veteran. And he founded the fastest growing Amazon research and marketing software out there, Datadive. So um, I'm going to let some more people in the room. We are live. Brandon, can you tell us uh, who's the training for today and why is this so important? Yeah, I think that the foundation of uh, building this business comes down to being able to find profitable products and uh, that are going to have a very high chance of making you money over the long run. Uh, so where I see a lot of people fail is that they don't validate the products uh, thoroughly enough, that they don't go deep enough into the into the weeds with regards to keyword research, uh, profitability. And uh, so they choose the wrong products and basically are, are you know, battling a, a very uphill battle. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is basically show uh, the audience uh, how we validate products using data and then how to do that very quickly because the okay. process I'm, I'm working the, on this um uh, sorry give me one second sorry it's okay let we can ask there we go sorry about that yeah so we can uh, uh basically uh walk through everyone Basically, what ends up happening is uh, you get business from two different sources. You get new new re revenue from new products and revenue from existing products. If you're just starting out, it's all new products. And, uh, and basically, you have to grow your business very quickly. But to launch a new product on Amazon, you probably have to look at over 100 products. Um, for me, if I look at 100 products, I might, and by look at, I mean, you know, do an analysis of them in a deep way where I may, might do a master keyword list on data dive. And then from there, I might order only two samples. So there's a lot of time that would normally go into that if it's going to take you three, four hours to look at a product. But now we do it in a way that takes you a few minutes, right? So it's minutes instead of hours. And then that way I can order more samples. I can get more products into my pipeline. And then for every two, two products I get, uh, samples of, I'm going to spend a little bit of time developing them, checking the quality, seeing if I can make a design that's going to be more appealing, I might end up placing one order. So for every 100 products, I place one order. And if I want to launch five products this year, I have to look at, you know, uh, a thousand products. And so that's a lot of research that you have to do. But it, at the end of the day, if you get really good at that, really fast at it, uh, and uh, then, then it's going to help you build a solid foundation of products and a, and a solid brand. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I can't wait to get into this. And before we get started with Brandon's training, just some quick housekeeping. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Brandon will be taking some Q&A during the presentation at some key points. Okay, and secondly, if you could kindly mute your mics as you're coming in, just so we can maintain the, the call quality, all right? So um, excellent, Brandon. I think other than that, we're ready to start. Uh, would you like to share your screen? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I'm going to walk you guys through is a, uh, a scorecard that we've developed to give a quantitative score for how good a product is. But there's a lot of things we look at. We look at, we look at a lot of factors, everything from the competition 
uh, to the number of keywords that drive sales. Uh, and uh, we want to figure out uh, what is good and what is bad, and then how good is good and how bad is bad. And at the end of that, if we can put a score to everything, we can end up with a number for a product. And if we look at 100 products, the highest, the, the highest numbers are going to have the best chances of success. So I'm going to walk you through that scorecard method, that validation method. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually find a product on Amazon and show you uh, like how that would work, right? So uh, let's go ahead and look at this scorecard to begin with. So to get an idea of uh, what the points mean, basically positive is positive, right? And then like, if it's a plus 250, that's a huge advantage that you would have because of the way the product is. So we're gonna go through and figure out what are the things that would give me a huge advantage and then what would be good and what would just be positive? And then the, the opposite is true. If it's minus 250 points, it's pretty much a like it's almost a deal breaker. It's something that if you have a couple uh, like issues with the product that are, are chalking up negative 250 points, that's a product that you might want to shy away from. Now, I must say that the first step to all of this is setting goals and uh, doing a resource evaluation. What is right for you might not be right for someone else. And then you, like Gary, as an advanced seller, would have a much higher risk tolerance than someone who's just starting out. And like someone with a large budget uh, might have a much higher risk tolerance than somebody else that's just starting out, right? So you have to keep in, fa uh, keep in mind that first and foremost, what is your budget for doing a product? And do you want to go all in? If you only have $40,000, do you want to split that from across a couple products to increase your chances of hitting on a cash flowing product? I would say about half the products that we launch, we continue to sell over a period of time. So we'll place additional orders. And, and then we consider ourselves really good at this. So if you're just starting out, you know, you really have to think to yourself, if I only launch one product and only give it one shot, I might fail even if I do a lot of things right. So uh, maybe maybe it's not right to go all in with all of your budget. Now, if you're only starting out with 10 or 15,000, you don't really have a choice there. I probably wouldn't do a product that requires less than that. We're gonna get into a little bit more, but I would say that you don't wanna uh, use all of your money on inventory either on that initial order uh, because you're gonna need to place a second order shortly after launch usually, and you're gonna need some money for marketing. So I like to take half of my budget and, and, and pretty much that's the amount that I need to spend on inventory to begin with. So once you analyze your budget and you come up with a number and then you have a risk profile and you say, you know what, I'm all in because it's the only 20 grand I got and I'm going to go all in with 20 grand. Um, but I want to make sure that I have a high chance of success. So that's a that's a, uh, a, you know, where you would say my risk profile is fairly low. I want to make sure that I've got a product that scores highly on this scorecard. Uh, I'm going to avoid electronics. I'm going to avoid skincare. I'm going to avoid supplements, fast moving, very aggressive, full of advanced sellers and well-developed brands with a lot of, uh, with a lot of uh, reviews and, you know, all of the advantages that those other sellers will have over you. Uh, tons of variations and uh, the ability to increase conversion rate in a number of ways. So we're going to avoid products like that if you have a lower risk profile, if you're just starting and you're kind of all in. You want to you wanna hit a solid single or double. Now, if you've got 20 active products and you're cash flowing really well and you're ready to spin it up a little bit and you want to take a shot at a, a much faster moving category and you're willing to step that risk profile up, then that's something to keep in mind. So do you have any unique value propositions or advantages? You should keep that in mind when you're doing your evaluation. So do you have a niche knowledge? Are you an ex expert? Do you have like a following outside of Amazon? Maybe you have a YouTube channel or a group, a large group of people that you interact with that you have access to that would support you. Um, an expertise that would, that would allow you to speak to your, your buyers in a way that other people don't know how to interact with, right? That's a huge thing to know. And uh, are you already selling it somewhere else? That, again, that's another huge advantage, but 
what I see happen all the time are people that come from a direct to consumer or off Amazon brand, like with an off Amazon brand and they have hundreds of products, they don't know which ones to start with on Amazon. By running all of them through the scorecard, you're going to get a really good idea. I should probably just start with like the top, you know, 10%. And that's going to allow you to really uh, prioritize which ones to go with. So step two is going to be about finding potential products. This is where you're going to use like software. Um, I like, uh, you know, Helium 10 has black box. Jungle Scout has a really great software. It's, uh, you know, like a product finder software. It's very similar where you can enter some criteria and it might be like how fast the product's selling, what price range it has and the category you want to sell in. And it's going to spit out a bunch of products that meet that criteria from Amazon. Basically just scrapes Amazon and finds all of the products that meet that criteria. That's a great way to just find random ideas, right? But you're doing it in a controlled way to where this, that, that criteria you set really is going to fit your budget. Uh, so like, if I only have, you know, twenty thousand dollars, and that initial order needs to cost ten, I can get to ten thousand dollars in inventory in a number of ways, right? I can do um, six hundred units, like six hundred and fifty units a month. So that's three months of inventory is around two thousand units, and it costs me about five dollars landed. That's ten thousand bucks right there. But I can do something that is twelve hundred units or 1300 units and uh, 250, right? So I can play with those two levers of velocity and price to try to get an idea of my um, where my budget is. And I think that that's super important to keep that in mind. The one pitfall that I would say when using the software though, that you need to be aware of is that when that software spits out a result that meets that criteria, you need to be very aware of what level seller that is that you found. That guy might be the 20th best seller of that product. And just by following proven methods for optimization and for launch, uh, you're going to blow him out of the water and all of a sudden you're in over your head. You thought you had $10,000 worth of units and that would be enough. And all of a sudden you sell out in three weeks because you knocked it out of the park and it's gonna take you another three months to get inventory and you're, you know, your product's dead before, before it started. So. What I would say is uh, make sure that you take it to the next level now and you just you use that to just to find an idea and then you analyze the niche with the best sellers, right? Now you can look at trends on Etsy. You can ask your network and your friends and your family what they're passionate about, products, ideas that they're seeing. I found a product recently on TikTok. Some, some uh, people were playing with something. I, I do toys. They were playing with something. I looked over at Amazon. They were driving traffic to theirs. They were selling at an insane price. And they were the only ones. And I was like, okay, well, I know it's not patented and I'm going to make a better design than theirs. So I had my factory work on it. I've made over $30,000 on the initial order of that product. And I'm about to sell out this week. I, I slowed it down and raised my price to match theirs. I was selling it under them because I wasn't too greedy. And, and I, you know, it's, it's weird where you get an idea. It could just be a TikTok video just like that. So you, you got to look around. You've got new product releases. You can go to fairs. I love to go to Canton Fair, but I don't, I don't always go there just to find a new factory. I'll go there just to see the booth and see all the ideas in the booth. And I'll take a ton of pictures, right? I use, uh, you know, like Evernote and I just go in there and I take a ton of pictures and I'll write some notes down. I'll ask someone what that is, uh, how much it costs landed um, in our, like I usually get quotes in RMB instead of dollar. And, and then I'll, I'll just make some notes. I'll take a picture of their brochure and their card, but then I'll usually be able to source it a little bit better than even that supplier had it because a lot of times those guys are brokers, but it's an idea sparker. And then I can go validate it with the right method like we're, we're about to show today. Uh, get exist. Look at your existing products. A lot of people don't go deep enough. If you've got a home run, you really nailed your audience, your design, you killed it. Launch four more of those. Launch variations onto that listing. Launch multi-packs. And then, and then doesn't hurt even create new brands and create new competitors to yourself with slightly different designs. You really found a winning formula there. Saturate that market with your own uh, products. Don't be afraid to do that. The other thing is uh, your existing audience. Ask them what they're buying. What, what, what do they frequently buy together? What do they like? What's coming up? What changes? Uh, what are the new innovations? And then talk to your factories. Um, this is great for us. We deal with over 120 factories with our products. 
on a regular basis, because we're such good customers of theirs, they know that we're good sellers. They will tell us first when they create a new design or a new product, they'll come to us with that product and give us the first rights on it at this point. But when you're first starting out, you need to be proactive about that. What's your new designs? What do you have coming out? Anytime you got a new design, let me know. And then bug them every week. Hey, what, what's the latest? What's the newest design? What do you have? And then go through the product to testing that. The next thing is like the feasibility. So step three would be a feasibility analysis. Uh, this is like a really quick qualifier before you have to do a deep analysis. This would be like, all right, I got this idea. First, let me figure out whether it fits my budget. For that, I might need to go look at the best sellers in the niche. And if I was thinking, okay, this thing might cost me about $7 to land. So what is my expected landing cost? I'll go to alibaba.com real quick and I'll look at the range. And I'm like, okay, it's like six, seven, eight bucks, right? And I go look at the best sellers and the five best sellers, six best sellers are selling twice as many units as I can really afford to do. And even in a month, it's out of my budget. I can hit no and I can move on, right? If I check no to any of those, I'm pretty much gonna just set this aside and move on to the next product. So I don't waste any more time, right? Um, it sucks. You wanna be in a position where you could take advantage of every great thing you find, but you have to be realistic in business and you have to manage your capital wisely. Otherwise you can risk your entire livelihood. Uh, it's very common. I see it happen all the time where people just get in over their head. They keep frequently running out of stock. They're chasing their tail and all they're doing is going in circles and they end up with a failed business. So start small if you have to, but don't be ashamed of that. We all started somewhere and you just compound it and build up on it. So then the other thing is like, what is the ROI on average selling? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, just two quick questions. One is someone asked, is this possible to have this live um, after the presentation? Yeah, for sure. I'm going to give this entire, uh, this is a checklist that they should save mm -hmm. and they can yeah. use. And then even with, we've built this into data dive now as well. Nice. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Uh, the other thing is, I just a quick comment. I love what you shared about finding products on TikTok. I mean, like we're evolving. So, you know, stuff that worked in like 2018, you know, there's like a lot of new strategies now, like, you know, what Brandon said, he's like spying on his competition. He found that new product. You're the only one selling that product on Amazon. You know, he uh, checked the numbers using Helium or Jungle Scout. And he's like, hey, you know, the market's there. And you know, Brandon just entered in and just sold out. So uh, I think that's a great tips that you just shared. Um, and I right, practice what I preach, man. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm having my, my team launch six more of those in different designs. I'm going to own, because what happens is right now I might be splitting the market with this other guy that kind of came up. He was like the first to start marketing this and making it popular again. And I'm like, all right, cool. Um, you know, and I came in and I crushed it. Right. And I'm like, all right, yeah. well, what's going to happen? My factory already had three people ask them to make it. So by the time I get my order back in, what's if I only launch, if I only replenish that one listing, I'm gonna have six more competitors. But you know what? I want to maintain a large percentage of this market. So I'm gonna launch six more myself and I'm gonna own yeah. half the market still, no matter what. Maybe even more, yeah. 60, 70 percent of the market. So I'm gonna keep a large percentage of that market share because I'm gonna optimize it better, I'm gonna rank it better. I got great designers and I'm really fast at product development. So let me play to my advantages and let me understand how a product, how this product life cycle works. I've seen it many times and I've, I've been on the wrong end of this where I, I'm like first, second or third into a niche and I just kind of rest on it. And within six months or a year, I'm out or I'm, I'm such a small fish that it doesn't even matter. So now I'm going to I'm going to use my network, my advantage and my knowledge and I'm going to jump onto it. and I'm going to own most of this market in the next six months. Excellent. All right. Uh, we have a couple of follow-up questions, Brandon. Do you want to take them now or do you want to save them for yeah, later? Yeah, we could pause here. Let's do that before we jump into the next, uh, uh, the, the uh, actual dive. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, Bavia asks, for someone starting new, is it not good to shoot for the seventh or eighth bestseller and take part of the market share? Your thoughts, Brandon? The hard part is that you can't play to be bad at Amazon, right? So like the methods we teach are just so consistent with writing your listing better, running PPC better, just pulling the right levers. So it's really hard to aim to be sixth or seventh. When it, what's realistically likely going to happen? Like it doesn't mean that you can be first either. 
that guy in first might be ranked for a ton of generic keywords. The second guy too, he might have a brand name where he's driving a ton of branded traffic. Maybe it's a toy and he's ranked for three toys for three-year-old girls, right? You just can't, you can't you're not going to realistically match that, right? But what you can do is when, when I break it down with the keyword research and the, the way that it works, I'll, you'll understand better. What ends up happening is like you're going to rank for 70, 75 percent of those keywords, the, the search volume within the first month, just by doing things right. And, and that's just a PPC only launch. Right. And what the problem with that is that you're going to fly if you have a good listing, like a nice product with good designs that op, like that you've optimized and tested the design of your product like you need to. If you've got great images, that's going to get good click through rate and you're competitive on price and your offer is there, you're not going to be able to slow it down. What's going to happen is you're going to convert better. You're going to get better clicks and you're going to be ranked better. You're going to be optimized better. You've unlocked your ranking potential. You're going to be fourth or fifth or maybe even third within that first month on most of the search volume. And uh, you're going to sell out of stock. So it's, it's like you can't really take your foot off the gas in this business. And as a matter of fact, it should be the opposite. You should be looking for opportunities to where you can go faster. Sacrifice a little bit of margin for a couple months uh, in order to keep pressing those keywords up and really try to go after a bestseller rank of a couple badges. And then you can start to optimize down to increase that margin back up. Uh, so yeah. it's, it should be yeah. the opposite. Uh, otherwise, Excellent. you're going to end up in a position where you sell out. Excellent. All right. And Daniel, Daniel's MacBook asks, Brandon, will you launch six separate listings or variations? So I'm going to try different uh, listings at first. And if something's not converting well, I'm going to stagger it with the launch, but I'm going to do it um, six different listings, completely different designs. I've, I've got a whole different type of take on a few of these things. Very different, uh, that I, but I love the, the the way that we thought about it to really take it out of the box a little bit. And then um, if something's not working, I'll stick it in as a variation uh, with some of the best sellers. Right. Okay, excellent. So in other words, you're trying to get as much of, of the real estate on the search page as you can with your own products rather than let your competition take that real estate. Well, right? I know the competition is coming, right? The, the winner is coming. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that I've got a, a wall of products there. And if people see my brand name, my brand name, my, they're going to be like, well, that's the owner in this niche. Like that's the guy yeah. I'm going to go with yeah. one, one of those. Now they're just even looking at that page. They're going to say, which one of his do I want? They're not even going to look at the others at some point. Right. Right. Excellent. Okay. It's kind of like Coke, like, you know, on the shelf, there's Coke, there's Diet Coke, there's Coke Zero. There's like, you know, you know, it, it's Coke, right? They own it. So Good stuff. Um, so I think Dwayne Matrix, he was, following up could you provide more info on the six more listings we already went over that i even asked why do you not recommend it launch in electronics Brandon? you know i think that it's because the Shen, the sellers out of shenzhen and gary can speak to this they're they're very ruthless um they're willing to work at a very small margin and electronics have a very limited life cycle especially if you're talking about accessories so think about how long you can sell a cell phone case for an iphone 13 the most it's going to be a couple of years, right? And it's going to dwindle very fast. And then they're on to the next thing, the 15, right? So uh, the 14 and then the 15. So you need to think about what is it that you can build that's going to have a long life cycle where the competition isn't willing to sell in single digit margins because they're getting supplemented by the government. They own the factory, right? Like that's the type of market uh, that electronics is. And uh, we just try to avoid it. Yeah, um, yeah, Brandon's right. I mean, if you think of the the Chinese sellers from their perspective, you know they can sell locally on like Pima and Taobao. So like in the states, if you know thin margins could mean like one or two dollars, but in China, thin margins could be like one to two RMB, which is like ten cents. So you know if they convert that to selling on Amazon, like think about their expectations, right? So I mean, well, not that, only that, and just, then they get a kickback yeah. on the amount that they ship out, right? Like the government is actually yeah. uh, giving them a supplement. Uh, and and they're getting it at a better price than you most of the time too, because a lot of times it's these factories that are even selling against you. Right, right. Okay, good stuff. Um, we have more questions, Brandon. You want to take them now, or I know you got a lot to cover, or you want to keep? Yeah, going? let's move on. Let's move on, and then we'll go. We'll jump back to it. 
Sounds so good. Basically, Sounds good, guys. Only proceed if your requirements above are met, right? Like, so you, you kind of like check these boxes. It needs to be yeses. Otherwise, move on. And now we're going to jump into this scorecard and we're going to look at it. Now, we've updated this slightly. I'll send this to you guys. And then there's a couple things that we're adding and it's constantly going to be evolving within Data Dive moving forward. So as long as you, you know, use Gary's code and get Data Dive for $50 off a month, then, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Then it's going to, you'll, you'll have the latest version of this scorecard built into it for every single product you research. So what I want to do is just first talk about like traffic distribution. So that would be like the number of keyword roots. And what I want to do is basically explain what that is by going to a master keyword list really quickly. So if you just give me uh, two seconds. Yeah, I can do this. So this would be This would be the, uh, like, this is our new uh, project management uh, view. I don't know if you've seen this, Gary. Basically, we've made it so that you can create these buckets and move products from uh, idea all the way through. I'll go through that later. But let's say I'm going to look at this dog bed. Dog bed is a massive, uh, massive uh, niche, right? You've got incredible competitors. It's an expensive product. It's a lot to ship. It's very, uh, you got a, a lot of different variations of it. And if you look at it, um, you, you're looking at, every single seller has many, many variations. So this is what we call our deep dive. And we're looking at all, of, we're looking at the fact that this is a trending up market with Google trends. And we're looking at the competitors like this best seller has all of these variations. Look how many variations. <laughs> all of these are variations for this best seller. And that's one of the reasons. Now look at this one. So it's not just a matter of sometimes looking at like, okay, I can afford to launch one of these but can you afford to launch 30 of them or 40 of them, right? I calculated to get into dog beds and do it properly. It was multiple six figures. You're looking at probably 250 to $350,000 if I wanted to enter and try to compete in this niche. Now, let me go over here to the master keyword list. You're gonna see that we have all the best sellers across the top and we've got all this information about them. So we got percentage of keyword search volume uh, up here. And we're looking at anyone above 80%, we consider very good at Amazon. So 27% of these are very strong and 47% are strong. That's a high percentage of these to be strong and very strong. So again, we're gonna, when we talk about how many are strong and very strong, we'll go back to that. So in our, in, in our checklist, we asked about root words. What I want to do is get you guys familiar with the fact that you can take all of the keywords that drive sales for a product, and then you can break it down into words and phrases that are repeated. Now, this means that like some people call this a dog bed for a lot, like a, for large dog. So bed, large dog, <laughs> dog bed, large. Some call it medium. Uh, medium, like a medium one. Some call it furniture for dogs. Uh, but you don't have a lot of variations of ways people are looking for dog beds, honestly, right? Like they're adding a descriptor for the type of dog they have. So you have some breeds, you have some sizes, and then basically uh, where, the, where it lid, lives. But it's either a bed or furniture, and it's either uh, a cot or uh, fits in a crate uh, or it's a size. To me, this does not have a lot of distribution and roots, right? So this would check the box if I go back over here to the scorecard now. I would say really dog bed, bed is like the main root. Everything else is like 10% or less. So I would say it has only one, it's very bad. <laughs> so I'm gonna check the box. This should work. Hmm. Maybe because I have it in. Okay, there we go. Sorry if it's not zoomed in for you, but uh, it actually adds up the score for you when you check the box when I give you the sheet. And it'll do the same on, uh, on, on Data Dive as well. So there's only one route. Really bad. This is almost a deal breaker because think about it. Our advantage is finding keywords. My advantage is being able to analyze a lot of products very fast. 
So why would I settle for a product that anyone can figure out what it's called? That's going against my advantage. It's a terrible, terrible system for me. So I want to find products with a lot of different ways people call it, right? I want to find something that I can uh, find all of the advantages and take, you know, all of the different ways they're calling it and then launch at all of them, rank for all of them or most of them. And then all of my competitors or most of my competitors are just focusing on one of those, right? So this is an example of something that's really bad. The distribution of root search volume was also really bad on this product. Uh, the top, the top root or one root was basically more than 90%. Again, that's very bad. Uh, but it's only 100, right? Sometimes you can, um, you can have a lot of roots, but you know, the distribution of search volume is, is pretty heavy towards like the top two. And then that would be like bad. This one's, uh, this one's pretty bad. It's, it's very bad. So it's a hundred. So you've got almost, almost a deal breaker. You got, you got very bad. And then number of relevant keywords with more than 350 search volume. So if we go back over here and we go look at the dog bed again, and we go back to the master, master keyword list, we've excluded some of these keywords that don't matter, like cat and a misspelling. We've taken off a couple of these. Uh, these. I can take off all the branded search terms by clicking this magic B button right here. So I've exclude, exclude seven keywords that have these brand names in them. And now I've got a pretty clean list. So I've got 375 keywords that are relevant. And I've got 2.7 million search volume, massive amount of search volume, such a fast moving product, insane number of sales. Look at this. This top guy right here uh, is selling even at $28 is selling $1.4 million in revenue a month. This guy's selling $2 million a month at $46 on average. Insane number of units, 52,000 uh, reviews and number of, uh, number of sales up here, 43,000 sales a month, over a thousand, almost 1,500 units a day that this guy's moving of dog beds at $46. Insane, right? Like super fast. You would need an insane budget. You need to be really, really good at this niche. You'd probably need some kind of name brand, outside traffic, presence in retail. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't launch this for many reasons, but you're just seeing what it is. So what I, my point is though, that there's a lot of keywords. That's really good. So we're going to go back to the scorecard and we're going to say, that's actually a good thing. There's a lot of keywords. And the reason, again, I want a lot of keywords is because I want a product that I can rank for all those keywords. I'm good at finding keywords. So the more keywords I can find that my competitors can't find, that's an advantage for me. Check, right? So product life cycle, will the product be relevant for less than 12 months? This is where I'm going to look at, um, is it a fad? Like electronics, right? This is where I would check the electronics uh, checkbox, minus 200 points. It's only good for 12 months. It's a fad maybe 24 for, for some electronics accessories, uh, lots of returns, things like that as well. But I think a dog bed's a dog bed. It's gonna be pretty relevant for a long time. I could say that it's a, like almost like a perennial or evergreen type of thing, right? So I could say more than five years. The ROI on this thing, to be competitive, I can tell you it's under 100%. I've done the math. Um, very, very expensive to ship. A lot of people are just making it up in volume, right? So it is, it is under 100. It's not 40, which would be a deal breaker, but it's under 100. Um, now, do we have the potential to, to compete on this in any way? So if we come back over here to our competitors, uh, I looked at, sorry, I clicked the wrong one. If I go back over here and I look at my competitors, do I have an opportunity here to uh, package this with a better fulfillment uh, in a way. Now, one of the things I'm looking at is uh, how, what are their fulfillment fees? And what I can do, does that say 9.99? Maybe that's an error. Oh, it's missing the first digit, okay. Hey, it says 9.99. What in the world? Maybe they're doing a giveaway. Or maybe they're doing, what do you think? or mispricing, that's gonna end up on slick deals. 18 inch for little dogs. 
And now this one's only $10.99. If anyone, oh, look how cute and little that is. That's why. Okay. That's why they, why they're some of the best, biggest sellers. So the advantage that this guy has, I can tell you right now, if he's shipping this thing for this price, is that he's rolling it up and vacuuming it, and it's coming in a box this big, right? It's literally like the, it was smaller than a uh, volleyball. By the time you receive this, uh, the packaging on this, uh, I can I can guarantee it. So um, I wonder if anyone in the like a million reviews, right? I wonder if anyone here's a here's a box that came in. No, it came fully out. That's crazy. But I think that they're more uh, their small one probably resonates with cats, right? Not for puppies or dogs that suffer from incontinence. Not washer dryer friendly. All right. Anyway, <laughs> that's uh, that means like uh, you can't really clean it if the dog uh, you know goes on it. All right. So you got some really cheap options, which isn't uncommon to see in these in these things. So what is the advantage that you could have? To me, it would be like if I if I can find a factory that can roll it up like a mattress and then. Um, and this is where my mind goes, right? Like I need to think about the product and then think about where, where can I get an advantage over my competition? If I can vacuum seal it and ship it in a third, the, the, the volume that they do, I can get uh, two thirds more here uh, on a container. And then my, my fulfillment fee is a lot less, right? So I'm already thinking about, okay, I mean, it's going to cost me a lot less to land at Amazon. It's going to cost me a lot less to fulfill it. I can discount the price below them and still make more money than them. Let's explore that, right? So what is that advantage? And that's what I'm kind of thinking of. On this one, I don't really see that we have an advantage. I'm sure all the best sellers are kind of doing that. So we're not going to check that box here. Can realistically get a utility patent. You can't patent a, a dog bed. Not going to work. So don't check that one. But that would be huge. If you can get realistically, you've got an invention that people are looking for or better a better mousetrap and people are still gonna want it because it's relatively the same price, but just solves the problem better. Maybe that's an opportunity for you to, to, to check a box. Design patents are easy to get around. They're only worth 50 points. Um, your design patent, basically someone can move a zipper three inches to the left and turn it upside down and now it's a different design. So easy to get around design patents. Don't, don't rely on them as a moat. You'd have to launch a ton of them to really start to like whack-a-mole people away, but someone's gonna find a loophole and get in eventually and start competing with you. So it's an expensive way to just kind of deter people for a little bit, but even then they're gonna start coming after with you with new designs right away. Every, every sophisticated seller is gonna redesign anything that they're launching anyway. So can redesign the product and add desired features. Look at the reviews, look at the negative reviews. Um, a dog bed, you're not really going to be able to do much, but maybe we just saw one, not machine washable. Okay. If the top 10 sellers are all not machine washable, removable cover, and I'm seeing that as a negative, 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 then I can add that. I can add a removable cover and I could check this box. That's probably not the case here. I mean, that was one instance, right? And I'm sure a lot of them have removable covers or are washable. Again, can save shipment and fulfilling costs. This would go back to packaging. I'd check this again. I think it's a huge advantage. Um, now, another thing you can do on the, the save shipping and fulfillment can be to like break piece, pieces apart. I have toys that like need you to like put poles inside of poles so that you can get to, uh, you know, 24, 36 inches. And all I did is go to the factory and say, chop that in half and put a, you know, put a connector so that I can put that in a standard size box. And I was able to launch that against people selling oversized products for double the price, right? Like my fulfillment at seven or eight dollars versus theirs at seventeen dollars, selling at twenty four dollars to their thirty four dollars, right? And and I'm I'm making just as much money and just flying the units and taking over the market. Like think about things like that as well. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point, Brandon. I mean, I I think you know you, sometimes you gotta be like MacGyver. I'm kind of dating myself like that old school TV show, right? He always thought of a way to, you know, he's stuck in that cave and he's able to like build a fire out of two sticks and, you know, build a boat and off the island, right? I mean, we got to think outside the box and, you know, that's how we, that's how we push it. So Give that anyway, guy a great. stick of gum, a, a rubber band and a match and he'll get you out anywhere, right? Yes, 100%, man, 100%. All right.
let's keep going. Uh, we got a yeah, lot yeah. of questions in the chat. Let me know when you want to take some questions, and then I'm I want to make sure with the scorecard. Yeah. Then we'll okay. do it. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna blow through the rest of these. I think that uh, you know you can save shipping and fulfillment. This is the competitiveness. We've got more than seven of the top ten uh, have more than a thousand reviews. We go back to that. That's probably the case on the dog bed. It's a negative. I don't really care about reviews most of the time if all the other things are good. So it's not a deal breaker, but it's still a negative. You still you still have an uphill battle here if a lot of them have a lot of reviews. A thousand's a lot. It's you know an extra whole digit. Uh, if they were if they were all above 500 reviews, I wouldn't care because as soon as I get to 50 or, or 101 reviews, it basically looks the same. The utility of the review goes way down over time. So the difference between 200 reviews and 900 reviews is negligible, but the difference between two and 20 is, or two and 100 is massive, right? So uh, you've got to you've got to keep that in mind. Uh, visual content that you can update, like you go back over here uh, to that deep dive that we looked at, and you can really get an idea of how many of them have a plus content how many of them have good images that show the the buyer so we've got this all expanded button on the right i can do collapse all and i can really just go quickly through these images and say okay uh do like what you're looking for are products where most of the people just have like product images and they're not even good a lot of photoshopped obviously photoshopped and stuff this is a pretty sophisticated market you got like benefits to the buyer what is the guy, what is the person buying this literally looking for? What are they looking to solve? You've got a uh, lifestyle combined with like infographics. This guy managed to get 15 images here and 8,000 uh, variations. So <laughs> just clearly just doubling down on their advantage of being a bestseller. Um, and so, I mean, you're going through here. You don't really see any that just don't necessarily belong to be here, except for this guy. Uh, you got a cot and then you got another, uh, it's just like different angles of the cot and some measurements of the cot, and then you got like sizing and then one dog on the cot, right? So, you, you know, this, this, is, this is the worst one and it's Amazon's basics. So it's hilarious, right? They're just, they're usually the worst. So um, you just go through, here's another Amazon basics. You got their, their, their sizing chart and then bad images. Um, but it's Amazon, you're still going up against Amazon. They're going to have great pricing. They cheat on fulfillment. So, you know, you can't compete with them on larger items sometimes. It's just the reality of it. But there, everyone else is really good, right? So you're just, you got to realize what you're going up against. So this would be a negative. This would, like, all of these guys are going to have, um, you know, A plus content and really be good. So we're going to, we're going to check them. The written content you're going to go through, you're going to make sure that they have, like, um, three or more top keywords in their title. Quick way to do that is like we have a battle of the titles that we use. Um, so, and we just moved it over to our listing builder. But if you come over here to the listing builder and you wanna look at uh, the titles, you can, you can go here. Here's the battle of the listings and you got titles. And now I can see where everyone's got these keywords in their titles. So do they have, do they have a lot of these in exact form? And, you know, these scores aren't very, uh, very, like this one's very good. We'll have, well, let me see how this is sorted. Yeah. Mm. I got an exact here. But you're looking for like a more sophisticated uh, market would be where you get a lot of matches. So um, extra large dog beds for dogs, ranking juice. It's sorted by ranking juice, so that's good. Let me pull that up. And let's take a look. Yeah, they got just dog bed. It's very interesting. I think there's a lot of room to beat these titles, but really there isn't because there's only one main route. So it doesn't really matter. I think that's the biggest problem with this keyword. What you're looking for is when you got a lot of exact terms, no one's really using data dive here. And then what you could do is, um, you got root, root usage. And then if you go over here to the title, uh, you can write your title. So we built this in so you can see what how you did compared to your competitors. Uh, let me grab one of these guys' titles. Uh, let me go back over here. This is the product scorecard built in. Um, let me look at this guy. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, listing builder. So what I'm trying to do here is just see what are they doing right and wrong with regards to hitting keywords? They've got dog bed, but they don't have for large dogs. They might have the large dogs on the other thing. And then what roots are they missing? Remember, keep in mind, this niche is weird because it doesn't have a lot of roots and it doesn't have a lot of parity in the way things are being called. It's really like a dog bed, large, medium, small, some breeds. It's about it, right? So for a more sophisticated niche, I can give you a better example, probably. If I come over here to my niche pipeline and I go into, um, where's that, this makeup kit? So this would be a title for makeup kit here. You can see that we got a lot more greens and oranges. So this has got kids makeup, kid, kids makeup for girls. Pretend play is another one, pretend makeup. If you're gonna sell the pretend one versus the one that really goes on. Toddler, girls. Uh, so you got a lot more variations here. You got makeup kit, kids makeup. Uh, you got makeup kit for girls, kids makeup kit for girls. You got ages, so you got eight, 12 um makeup sets let's see makeup kids misspelled little girls so you got a lot of different roots here this one's a lot wider on the root see how the the root distribution's a lot wider here that that to me is a much more um uh, of a niche that i would be more look looking to do this funny enough this don't do kids makeup kids either <laughs> it's very saturated it actually scores very low on the score card but it was just an example for you to really get an idea on the um, and how we're looking at the distribution of the data, the the the, the keywords, right? Uh, I think that that's really important. So written content, um, I would say that uh, you know they all have dog bed in their in their title, so you you got to give a negative. Amazon SEO, more than ten competitors are on the first page of at least sixty. Yeah, a lot of them. Remember that of the top 20 or 15 that we were there, over 60% were, uh, like I think I was looking at the top 20 and over 60% were above 60% uh, of the search volume. They were either good or very good, remember, or strong or very strong. So that would be a huge negative. That means it's saturated. Like all the competitors that are there are very good at Amazon. You don't have a lot of room to beat them on keywords um, and everything else kind of has to line up for you to want to do this product, right? Uh, selling price is under $10. I don't like to sell cheaper products. A lot of people have different thoughts about this. My biggest thing is that margins can disappear very quickly. Bouncing a container off of a 3PL and then back to Amazon instead of sending it direct can add a dollar per unit very quickly to a product. So if, you're, if, you're, if your profit was already only a couple dollars, your profit can disappear tomorrow. Now, tacos are up, PPC, cost per clicks are up. Uh, your PPC spend is up. Margins are, there's massive margin compression. Those cheaper products are harder to run ads to. They're harder to de deal with. And it's just, uh, I try to avoid them. I, I give it like almost a deal breaker if the average seller is under 10 bucks. It's just my, my preference, but some people, you know, you want to deal in that. But trust me, like it's really tough to like become the best and defend being the best because PPC can be your best defense and your best way to pump ranks for a normal product and you're okay spending on PPC to, to stave off the competitors and to push ranks and, and to really grow. But if you don't even have the room to do that because the product is too cheap, it's really just you're, 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 there's, there's not a lot of things you can do there. So let's say that this is uh, between 16 and $49. Uh, is the market shrinking? No, it's actually going up. Uh, seasonality. There's no real seasonality to this. I, I'd say that people buy it year round, but it does spike in the winter a little bit. But um, product is specific to a non Q4 holiday. That's a big negative. Product is for an entire season. Um, so this is, we're just going to leave this blank. It doesn't really have any seasonality. There's no, sp uh, sp uh, it's not specific to a season. Not It's not a winter product or a summer product. Uh, variations. So at least six of the top competitors have four or more variations. We saw that. It was actually like <laughs> at least six of the competitors had at least 20 variations. So there should be another layer on top of this to subtract like 300. <laughs> it, should, it should be more than a deal breaker. Unless you just have huge and really deep pocket. Major brands. I didn't really see any major brands, but like they have, they're entrenched. 
Um, competitiveness, at least five of the top competitors are bought and sold by Amazon. Uh, not, I don't know. I didn't look at that. Do you know if they were 1P or 3P? We can go look really quickly. We'll go back over here. Well, let's go look at the dog bed. And we can see really quickly if it's uh, sold by Amazon or not. And it's uh, FBA, FBA, Amazon, one, two, Amazon. Three, four, Amazon, five, Amazon. It's five of the top uh, 15, but only two of the top 10. So where does that put us? Um, less than three, I would say there. I'd say top, I, like you want to look at the top 10 to 15. I'd say, I'd say it's right there. Uh, if, if anything, you can leave it neutral because it's kind of in between this. Is it a developed niche? Yeah, it's a huge developed niche. Like what I mean by developed niche also is like a, a best, the best example I can give of that is if you look at exercise bands, that's where like, um, so it's not about, it's, it's not about bundles on this one. It's more about variations and about, about how they've, they've, they've gone about this, but like exercise bands started out with like someone selling two exercise bands. And it just started like that. And then someone sold three and then someone sold five and then someone sold different, uh, different packs. And then someone threw in, uh, you know, an extra accessory and then someone else threw in an accessory and a DVD and someone threw in uh, uh, like a, a PDF, like workout PDF and a DVD and uh, five bands and accessories. Right. And so now the whole first page is all these like super saturated extra like bundles of everything. It's not just exercise bands anymore. To me, that's a niche that is just progressing, progressing, progressing. And it's just who can outdo who. Um, and, and it's super far along. So that's a big negative for me to, to think about that. Um, the, neg the score on this is negative 600. I would, wouldn't even come close to doing it. A good score isn't even zero. So this is like worse than worse. Uh, I, wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't do this product. So um, that's kind of like the scorecard method. And I can go a little bit deeper into, into a couple of these examples that I have and a couple of the functionality after we answer some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Brandon. So let's get back to some of the questions I asked earlier. Um, Beto asks, what do you do to optimize the product design? Change the color, change size, and is there a charge from the manufacturer for that? If so, is that very expensive? Yeah, I didn't. I'm sorry, the sizing? Uh, what do you do to optimize the product design? Change the color, change size, and is there any charge from the manufacturer for that? If it could so, be, is that right? Yeah, it could, yeah. Be, it could be all of the above. Now, if it requires tooling or molding, then they're going to charge you for that. Um, a lot of times, like, they'll work with you with a minimum order quantity. What I often will do is if they tell me there's a charge on something, I'll say, good, I, I don't mind paying that and partnering with you. Got to keep in mind the the the... The relationship that you have with your factory is supposed to be one that is mutually beneficial. So always approach it as a win-win and say, I'm okay with, with covering that cost up front, but once I order a certain thousand num number of thousands of units, uh, give me that in credit towards another order. Uh, and then they'll often agree to that, right? But you want to increase, like you want to always be looking at uh, size, uh, color variations, uh, optimizing for packaging, optimizing for, uh, for shipping and for fulfillment. Excellent. Brandon, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time because we're coming on to the end of the hour. Can we share more about data dive if people want to learn more and, and uh, uh, just some more about that in case people have any questions, how they can use this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, so your score or uh, your code is seven F S S. It gets you, uh, you know, fifty dollars off. All of your users get fifty dollars off per month forever, right? It doesn't expire or anything, and it's only uh, one hundred and fifty dollars a month for the first user, and then if you have a team. Uh, but I can I can run you through a couple of the features of it. Like uh, basically, what what ends up happening is you do a dive. You choose these top fifteen or twenty sellers of a product. You get this master keyword list right away again, which has all of this information, plus all the keywords, it breaks down the data. There's some really great examples that we've, that we've done where it just, you can rewrite the title based on the holes you find in your product uh, relevancy and, and niche. 
and you see an immediate improvement in rank, right? Or if you're going to launch a brand new product, you're looking to use this for validation and then to write your listing uh, very effectively uh, with the listing builder, but then you can launch it with PPC. So if I, um, if I come in here to PPC keywords and I import the keywords, then I'm going to be able to come in here and, and launch my, my campaigns directly from the keyword research onto Amazon. So you tie in and you can push keyword campaigns or PPC campaigns directly to Amazon and you can sort them by root word. So if I want a uh, dog bed, everything with dog bed uh, and then large dog and medium dog, right? I want them sorted by uh, and small dog. That's helping me decide which routes are going to be performing better than others. And it helps me optimize my campaigns later. And it also helps me push uh, traffic towards root words that I want to focus on, right? So this is, uh, this is like one of our best things. Then you come in here to your naming conventions. You come in here and you review your campaigns. Like you can distribute your budget however you want. Let's say I want to spend $600 and I want like a minimum of 30. And you can <laughs> at least, the daily budget should be at least 1200. Why is that? <laughs> And then uh, you can come in here. Oh, that's because I did the minimum. And <laughs> there's so many campaigns. Uh, so you've got 40 campaigns, 240 keywords targeting all of these root words. And here are all the campaigns, right? And you just, uh, you can push them straight to Amazon when you launch the product. And it's going to take care of doing your PPC in the most impactful way with exact targeting, hitting all your keywords, hitting all your roots, organizing it so it's easy to optimize later. And um, that's just on the launch and the PPC side. And then you can monitor. So like you can use it for project management. We just released this tool. This is why I was asking Gary if he saw earlier. You, what ends up happening is you do, you do a ton of dives, like a hundred dives on products and you got a couple. You should, you should mark them all into product research uh, in the bucket. And then you can assign team members to own different buckets. So if I've got my, uh, my board view here, I've got my product research person just doing research sheets all day, scoring, 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 scoring. If something's above a score, they move it over to sources and samples. And then I have someone assigned to sourcing that's going to go get me samples, go look for, look for factories. And now that person on my team that does the sourcing. Now, when you, when you own your own business and you're just starting this business, you kind of sit in all these seats on your org chart. Like you got to visualize an org chart and it's you wearing all those hats, sitting in all those seats, yeah. owning all those KPIs. But this helps you manage each product like a project. Now, this product is no good. I can go into it and I can move it over to the, um, to the graveyard, right? And it's dead. And now I save it and move it over and it's going to end up way over here where I'm not going to do this product, right? So you've got you've to be able to move this along and, uh, and, and keep a track of all of your potential products within Amazon. We allow you to do that as well. We're just developing more and more. You can manage all your, your team members, your buckets, your labels. Basically, we built Trello, Monday, or Asana kind of into Amazon uh, project management, team management tools into, into Datadive for you. And the best part cool. is like going to be your, uh, you know, once you dive into something, you know, you really get an idea of who's selling what, um, you know, the current competitors. And then you can track that over time as well. So you got a niche tracker as well. You can keep diving it, keep track of these competitors and really just see who's growing, who's doing what over time as well. Um, Excellent. Like I said, it's uh, normally $150 a month for the first seat. With your code, it becomes $100. And then the next seat's only going to be like, I think 50 bucks, 70. It comes down to like almost $50 for the next user. So if you have a team of three or four people using it, it's a couple hundred bucks a month. Excellent. So uh, just to recap, Datadive is a product research tool that sits on top of Helium 10. Is that right? Yeah, currently it pulls from Helium 10. So if you, yeah. uh, like we're, we're working a deal right now, we're trying to work with them or another where mm -hmm. we're going to be able to provide data in a way that you won't need Hel uh, to also have a Helium 10 subscription. So that's yeah. in the works. Yeah. Uh, okay. But in the meantime, you'll need you'll need the ability to to run Cerebro. It layers on top yeah. of X Ray currently. Uh, if you're familiar, if you're if you you teach around uh, Helium ten a lot. Uh, we do some around Helium ten, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so currently that's the tool that it layers on top of, um, yeah. you know, it might change in the next 30 to 60 days. Okay. Excellent. So, um, so Brandon hooked us up with a discount code. You can save $50 a month off data dive for life. All you got to do is go to data dive dot tools. I think this could save you a lot of time, you know, especially in the product research phase. I mean, rather than having spent hours or weeks, I mean, you could get this done very quickly. And just to be transparent, I am an affiliate of Data Dive. I believe it's one of the best tools out there for product research and because it can save you guys a lot of time. So if you do sign up with our link, you're gonna save 50 bucks a month and then I will get a small commission and help pay for my coffee. And coffee keeps me going these uh, late nights and early mornings. So thanks so much. Uh, we have a couple of quick questions. I know there's a lot of questions in the chat and thank you. We have like 80 people still left at the end of the hour. Thank you guys. Um, Roth asked, is there a video tutorial with Data Dive, Brandon? Yeah, there's quite a bit. I mean, uh, you're also an affiliate with uh, with the Inner Circle as well. Um, I think yeah. your members get over a thousand dollars off, and we're doing a training. I don't know how many of you how many of you guys are in the United States. <laughs> like, if you're, um, yeah, yeah. How many? Raise your how hand many? or type U.S. if you're in the U.S. Or why yeah, not? Because we, yeah. Yeah, we, we are pretty global. I, I, normally half of us. So am I, right? US. Even yeah. the inner circle yeah. has half of its people all throughout the world because you can sell on Amazon from anywhere. We have a yeah. two-day workshop training coming up, but it's not just on Data Dive. It's really about the whole process. It's two different tracks. We've got an executive track for people doing 5 million and up that are looking to go to 50 and 100 million. And then on the other side, we've got two days of interactive workshops um, that we're going to be working with you from the stage and breaking into groups. That's called Camp Ecom. If you use the code 7FSS as well, uh, which is again, Gary's code for a discount, you save $200 on your, on your code, on your ticket to campecom.com. That's the two day workshop, January 8th through 10th in Orlando that we're gonna be really diving deep and going from A to Z. We're doing product research, validation, but I'm going to take you all the way through. By the end of the last day, we're doing launches and PPC. Um, so lots of interactive on PPC, breaking out like everything from uh, downloading spreadsheets and working within spreadsheets to run macros. And we're going to provide you with macros that you can run on your PPC so you understand how to optimize your, your marketing and stuff. So um, yeah, I guess there you go. You got, you got everything there, which is awesome. Um, but Inner Circle is our is our uh, is our full college course and our mastermind. Uh, with Gary's code, you save a thousand dollars there as well. Uh, and I think it was a thousand, or I give you fifteen hundred last time. I got Black Friday bugs, so I think I might give yeah. you fifteen hundred. I'll go increase it. <laughs> All right, let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. But it's uh, excellent. Yeah, don't don't tell anyone. You know, <laughs> a bunch of Inner Circle members are watching. They just. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, but it's, uh, Excellent. Excellent. yeah, it's, it's an annual membership and you got, uh, five to 10 live classes a month. We do a weekly call to ask any questions. We've got 1100 members over 400, seven and eight figure sellers. We break into many mastermind groups. We, uh, we, we have an abundance mentality. We're just, we're there to share and to help each other. doesn't matter. Uh, if, if we're all in the same category, I'm sure the overlap on products is small because there's so many products on Amazon. So it's never been a problem to share and to be open and, and for everyone to, to be able to succeed and be stronger together. So that's, that's the, what we preach in there. Excellent. Excellent. So I highly recommend you guys check that out. Um, Camp Ecom at the link up there that will be in January. That's a two day in-person conference led by Brandon and his team. Um, we're over time already. So Brandon, yeah. I don't mind staying uh, for questions, but if you got to run. Yeah. Okay. We can stay for a little bit. And if you guys have to run, thank you so much for coming. If you tuned in late, uh, we will have the YouTube or replay link available for everyone that registers. So check out your inboxes. It should be out within the next 24 hours. So we'll make sure everyone gets that. Um, okay. So let's do a rapid fire Q and A. Let's just like, you know, breeze through this fast as we can. Brandon, sound good? Sounds good. We'll do it really quickly. I'll answer them quickly. Okay, cool, cool. Um, okay, Nikita asked earlier, would you consider launching different brands in one niche to provide customers with a choice, kind of like Gap, Old Navy, and Banana Republic? Yeah, I, I, I'm not opposed to that. I've done it in the past. Um, I've got 
I've, as a matter of fact, I think I have four brands in one niche currently. <laughs> so um, I've yeah. been known to do that. And, and it goes along with owning more of the niche. If you're just really good at understanding the keywords in a niche, realize most people are bad. You've got an opportunity to really diversify with design, design parody and things like that, then go ahead and do it. Good to see yeah. you, Robert. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, ALM Khan asks, if you see the brand BA sheet keywords analysis, I think he's, he means brand analytics and find good keywords and you target them and also Helium 10 or Data Dive good keywords but it is not converting even taking buying program and have some good reviews, but still no orders. What would be the good strategy to get good orders? Yeah, so I just, I just did a workshop on this earlier where it's uh, about conversions. Uh, you've got to dial in your, 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 and optimize your listing way ahead of time. You, like everything in business is two things. It's, it's, it's traffic and conversions. The example I give is like a hot dog stand on the corner. You've got, um, the corner you're on is the traffic. Are people passing by that corner? And then the number of people that buy hot dogs are your conversions. So how attractive is your hot dog in your offer? How, how attractive? If you're selling them out of a dirty cooler, you're not going to get very many conversions. But if you got a beautiful stand with great signs, people are going to love your hot dogs. If they're smelling it, they're seeing it, you know, you're going to sell a lot more hot dogs. So what I would say is like dial in the conversions, go test. Maybe you chose the wrong like style, maybe the wrong color. Maybe your uh, your images just aren't optimized to, to where they could be. Maybe you're, you know, and you've only got two levers there. You've got your content, your visual content, and your price. The worse your visual content, the lower your price has to be to start getting conversions. The better your content gets, the more you can charge. So you need to, you need to keep that in mind and use tools like, uh, Gary, do you do you recommend pick food to everyone, or at, which tools do you usually push people to for, for testing? Yeah, pick food is a great tool. We've had them on. Um, yeah, pick food is a great one. But I mean, take well, that with a grain of great. salt because because like the the mentality of you know like the buyer mentality versus like someone just looking at images, it's a little different. It's like farther down on the the purchasing behavior curve. But it is a good way to to validate. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. It's not perfect. I agree with you there. Um, I think that. But it's going to let you know, like, whether the, the style or the image is resonating with the person, like with somebody more. And then you just, yeah. you know, you, you run smaller tests and then you like you really you really ramp it up from there. I like to run those micro tests of like, you know, just a handful of people and see, like, is it like an eight to one? Is it eight to one or is it uh, is it five to one? Like, or is it 50 yeah. 50? And once once I start to tilt the needle, then I'll, I'll ramp it up from there as I dial it in. But. Yeah. yeah, dial in your conversion first, like before you keep running traffic at it. You should have done that pre-launch. Now you need to do it post-launch. There's a ton of different ways to make good main images. Yes, excellent. All right, let's keep going, guys. I don't want to keep Brandon here all night, so I'm sure he has a lot of stuff to do as well. So Andrea made a comment earlier, small electric seller here, not to paint negative stereotypes, but these factory sellers in this niche are also cutthroat and absolutely maliciously will sabotage your listing. It's not a niche I'd recommend for someone starting. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, ALM Khan also commented, if the PPC CPC is higher on AI top 100 keywords and even less than 100 search volume, we can find lower PPC. What is the best way to rank? Yeah, so these will be like our launch keywords, that 350 search volume and up but you can tilt it down. Like we have a, a lever there where you can go down to hundred um, search volume. And it really depends how, how big the niche is already, but 350 and up is kind of the bar where we, where we see that it being out of tilted at all. And even on the mm -hmm. smaller side towards 350, it's not a lot, but it's, you know, a couple sales a week or, you know, so it, 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 it overall, it, the aggregate of it is important. And that's what we're trying to show you there. Excellent. Nikita asks, Brandon, do you launch standalone products or only product lines with potential to launch multiple similar products? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm now developing out a brand. Like for the last few years, I've just been focusing mostly on two brands. But when I, at one point, I had as many as like seven active brands. Um, I'm down to maybe four or five and I don't really launch new products into three of them, right? I'm launching into just two brands now on, on a couple accounts. 
So I, I would say that like when you're first starting out, it's okay to have an open brand strategy. Just go with the lowest hanging fruit and the ones that have the highest chances of starting to cash flow for you. And then use that cash flow to start doubling down on brand building. That's more of my approach on it. Um, I think if you're really good at Amazon SEO, then that should be where your strength is. A lot of people think differently. A lot of people put a lot of effort into brand building and off Amazon efforts. But to me, it's like, what is the uh, alternative cost of my time on doing that? What is the ROI on my time for doing that? So uh, where I could just develop more products on the Amazon, keep, keep launching them and keep making more money. Um, and most Amazon sellers are brand agnostic. They didn't find you because they stumbled across your Instagram. They don't go check your Instagram before they click buy on Amazon. So just keep that in mind. Excellent. So coming and Roth asked about the replay. Yes, replay will be available. YouTube link will be sent out. Nikita asks, is selling products under $35 worth it, especially considers PPC and most niches? Is uh, selling what? I'm sorry. You selling already answered. Products under thirty-five dollars. Oh, okay, okay. Already worth answered. It. Already yeah. answered. It. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Bava, Bavia, sorry, Bavia asks, I was strongly considering Montessori bookshelves. Would love to see what Data Dive thinks of it. Children's furniture is tough, and you get you can do a lot of creative things with with saving uh, space, but it's going to be very heavy. A uh, lot to ship. Um, yeah, like you can easily do that dive, right? Um, and Montessori bookshelves is another way of, I guess, for kids, like uh, children's, toddlers, bookshelves or furniture. Just look for the best sellers uh, and do a dive for like the top 20 sellers. You'll get an idea uh, once you go through the scorecard. I, I don't know that it's that competitive, but it, there's a lot of barriers to it, right? You have to be pretty sophisticated with shipping and logistics and be efficient with your supply chain in order to... Um, to, to do it. And, and there's a really slow turnover there per year. So your capital's tied up a lot with furniture too. So uh, once you go through it, you can make a decision on whether it fits your niche. Yeah. Excellent. Andy. And coming at, what are some of the methods you use to decide on product differentiation? I, I think your scorecard went through that, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we went through the yeah. differentiation opportunities. Okay. Uh, Beto asks, there's a few options for data dive. How should I choose if I'm just starting out and I'm doing it by myself? Yeah, so the individual account with Gary's code is all you need. It's 100 bucks a month with the code instead of 150. And then that gets you uh, the product research or the product management uh, tools. You have to request them, but they'll be turned on for everyone soon. Right now they're in beta and I've just been telling everyone to email support and bother my team and then they turn them on. Okay, excellent. Um, Saad asks, could you show the project management tool again, please? I think that was data dive, right? You had a Yeah, yeah. This is within data dive. So like this is actually just the uh like these are all dives that you did. And so once you once you assign them into a bucket or a label or to somebody, you can come over here and you can you can look at a uh what project someone owns what labels you've put on them and what, uh, what buckets, what bucket it's in. And then you can assign exclusive, like people can only see a bucket or, you know, you can, you can really play around with it. It's uh it's pretty, pretty pliable uh, to, to manage the, the growth of your business as, as it grows. Excellent. And um, I, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Says, great session. Someone to have access to beta dive. I can help him to make the most out of it. Uh, Robert says, got to run. Thanks, Gary and Brandon. Rich says, what about brand registry and the importance of having your brand trademark? Super important. I think that having A plus content tilts uh, the, uh, the conversion. Videos help. So don't, don't sleep on that. Just remember to make a short brand name so you don't take up too much valuable space in the beginning of your title. Great tip. Thanks. Andy asked, can you add a new ASIN to an existing dive? Andy, only if hey, you, Brent, how you, going, only if you make me some more biltong. If you make some uh, more biltong. My, my butcher is waiting for you to come back. He's, he asks about you. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was the best thing I've ever had. I, I tried to make it last as long as possible. 
<laughs> you should be selling that on Amazon, Andy. Uh, let me see real quick. Uh, if I go into a niche. So what, what happens is I, is I set up a niche, I do a dive, and then I'll go back in and under a different set of keywords, I'll find like four more aces, which I want to add to it. So. Yeah, what you're going to do is you're going to need to go into the niche tracker and then you're going to need to dive it again. And we're going to make this more automated. It's on, we have a huge board with like a million things we're, de we're developing and we're prioritizing, but this is something that I want to make more automated. And as we, uh, over the next couple months, this niche tracker is going to be something that you can, you can assign. It'll say filter, uh, and then show the research. Uh, let me see. Uh, cause it'd be good if we could add on, you know, so if you can have a, if you, yeah. if you see when you go back you and you read the things here, but sometimes you can add me. And sometimes I have beta version on that you guys don't have. So I have to be aware of that. What I would say is when you hit dive again, you're going to want to go dive it. Um, I want to add not just the top 25 competitors, but to die, like dive these, but be able to add them. So that's what I've asked as a dev, uh, for like a dev request is to not just dive these again, because you could do that, right? Um, but I want you to be able to dive these plus an ASIN, or I want you to be able to yeah. add on ASINs into here. So this is where you would do that. And then, and then you would pull up that sheet. So if you pull up that sheet, then, then, you know, that's, that's going to lead to the, uh, the most recent master keyword list. Okay, cool. When are you coming home? Home. Yep, back to Australia. Where I am home. No, uh, <laughs> I, I know November is far out. I'll, I'm, I'm probably it's too selling far. seller. It's too far. I know, I know. But it's, we need, it's a we whole, need lot you of back here before June. I'll do my best. Okay, good luck. I'll um, probably be in China thanks. at some point. So if I can swing by, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> good as. Good as. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks, Andy. Brandon, a quick question. Which marketplaces does Data Dive work in? I mean, which any country besides the US? Any, yeah, any, any country. country. Yeah. Any country. Anywhere so, that like, Helium 10 has data currently, and then uh, in, in, in the future, it'll work pretty much anywhere as well. Excellent. All right. Um, so let's wrap up. Darsha asked, how do you request reviews? Uh, you ask them nicely. <laughs> uh an insert card uh is usually a great place to do that you uh just be uh make sure you never do it quid quid pro quo so you never say if then in your <laughs> if you do this then i'll do that like never do that like never say that in any 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 communication with a buyer uh that's that's a big no-no but if you ask nicely in your in your review you ask them to sign up for a uh free gift or um don't ask them on the same gift card if, you have, if you're trying to drive them to your site for a free gift or for something else. But once you have them there and then you, uh, you communicate with them later, you can ask them nicely. But don't also, don't offer them a rebate, a gift card or anything in exchange for that review ever. You'll, you'll get kicked right off the platform. Yeah, incentivized reviews, big no-no. All right, Saad uh, commented, I love listening, Brandon, all the time. I was late tonight, but I wish if these sessions announced went. 12 hours before, so I can attend on time. Sorry for the late notice, Todd. We'll do our best to, to inform everyone. Uh, but I think we did a good job. We had a lot of people come out. Uh, AOM contest, thanks, Brandon and Gary, for this amazing session. You're welcome. Ross says, thanks, Gary and Brandon. I'm curious, guys, what was the number one takeaway that you got out of this? I mean, Brandon went through A to Z, all of the product research, data, data dive, all the nitty gritty. What was the number one takeaway? Please drop it in the chat before we go. I would appreciate that. And uh, Nikita, asked, Brandon, you mentioned that you now only focus on two to four brands. Now, do you initially exclusively select categories that are large enough for you to launch dozens of products? On the other hand, would you consider launching products in a niche that's limited to around 10 to 15 products? Yeah, I think it's fine to launch into tighter niches if you know if the scores are great, the competitors aren't very good, and you know you can cash flow them. Figure out like because ultimately, like the niche is bigger than you think. Almost every niche, even if you're like, what you need to think about is who is the avatar that you're serving, and then you can then you can zoom out. 
it's like, okay, I, I have a, a brand for, um, you know, men who are construction workers. Well, you zoom out from that, then you've got, you know, men who work outdoors. And then you zoom out from that and you've got, you know, men who wear boots. <laughs> so you zoom out from that. And eventually, you know, you can keep zooming out and find more and more products that would fit that same person, right? Excellent. There he is, great, great organizer. Uh, always, always. Awesome. Uh, doing my best, doing my best. Uh, Nikita, in your opinion, what is the benefit of focusing on one large brand compared to multiple small brands, especially if you are considered exiting? Yeah, when you get to the size that I'm at, then the, the benefit starts to compound. But when you're first starting out, probably your first three to five million, it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, but, you know, we're, we'll do north of 20 million this year. And like now I can start to focus on multi-channel with that brand retail presence. Um, I've got I've got I've, doors open when you get to a certain size, your efficiency start to scale and it just starts to make more sense to focus on one niche or one brand versus multiple at some point but it's usually when you get much larger excellent all right so some quick takeaways uh said data dive Nikita says thanks a lot brandon and gary which is number one takeaway it takes money to to make money and he says always a great presentation from brandon thanks gary you're a great organizer you're very welcome deborah at uh, the product potential is a great feature but also can see how flexible the software can be for many things. Awesome. Gary, do you have a code for Helium 10? I do. I don't have it off the top of my head. Top of my uh, head. If my team member, Larney, can find it and drop it in the chat, that would be great before we sign out. Um, I do have it here. I believe this is... Sorry, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Um, Shane says, I am a new inner circle member and the scorecard is really working well for me. What is your best advice for handling returns more so for people not based in the US? It's a black hole as in what to do with unfillable product. Yeah, so I ship my goods. So you're not based in the US. Is your entity based in the US? Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, it's worth destroying them. It depends on the value of the product. If the value of the product is more than $40, $35, $40, there are companies that will refurbish them. You can send them new packaging. They will refurbish the product or see what, what percentage of the products are new, but the packaging needs replacing. They'll repackage it and send it in for you. If you're in a niche, you can sell used and new, then they'll, re they'll even repackage the used and send them into your used listing. Um, yeah, there's there's all sorts of things you can do. Um, but I have a uh, so I'm based in the US. What I do is I ship all of my toys directly to a, a charity that deals with over uh, 20,000 poor families. Uh, and uh, every single year, they just accumulate pallets of my used toys, they quality control them and throw out the broken and, and, and bad ones. And then they uh, so even if my toy came with like 10 accessories, like uh, they got the little pieces that are still fun for the kids to play with and repackage them because a little kid isn't going to know the difference, right? Like they're still going to want to play with that toy, but they, they find unique ways to make it something that a kid will still enjoy. And then they give them out on, on the holidays and at certain, certain times of the year. And then they just give me a write off for the whole thing. And then I can, you know, I don't have, it goes straight to them, but it, it's still doing good. So there's charities you can give to and try to get a write off on if you have a US based entity and it's worth it if you're, you know, percentage there. Uh, my overstock I send to a warehouse and I donate that to a much bigger charity, um, you know, like Toys for Tots, I'm a partner with them. And then, uh, you know, like liquidation is one thing, but that's a pain in the butt, you know, you got to find a guy willing to take it and he's going to give you pennies on the dollar but it's still better than a zero write off, like, you know, against your, you know, there's, there's limits and stuff. You just got to know your tax law. You got to figure it out. But if you're not us based, I don't know, you're probably might be better off destroying it. If it's a valuable product, there's probably companies out there that'll still pay you for it. Maybe 50 cents a dollar, each item, something to, to, to balance off the cost of instead of destroying it, you know? Yeah. 
Um, one of the companies that I'm aware of is Backtrack. It's run by Brandon Dupke. He's a yeah. seven-figure seller, and he was like one of the biggest sellers on eBay back in the day. So that's something that he's doing. Um, I just dropped the link in the ch- in the chat back dash track dot com. And yeah. me personally, I've also donated to like um, the Salvation Army. If you have something that could help, like you know, underprivileged families, etc. I'm not based in the U.S. I had um, my my assistant, my virtual assistant, just coordinate, and well, we had that shipped out to, to our three PO, and then they sent it to the charity. So that could be an option as well. Um, so hopefully that helps. All right, guys. Um, I also found the Helium 10 discount code, 20% off six months. So Deborah was asking about that earlier. I dropped that in the chat as well. That is an affiliate code and I'm an affiliate just to be transparent. All right, guys, we covered a lot today. Thank you so much, Brandon, for this deep dive into product research. Definitely check out Data Dive. I um, dropped the link again for, for anyone that wants to check it out. Make sure to enter our code. 7FSS to get $50 off a month for life. Um, and then, sorry, there's a typo there. There's a $200 discount off of Brendan in person event, Camp Ecom in January as well. So, um, any, yeah, hope, anything hope else? I'll see you guys yeah. in Orlando. And yeah, you can't get yeah. out of uh, out of Asia, unfortunately. I would have loved to have you come, come over and have some uh, drinks and s'mores by the campfire. I would love that. My son would like that. But um, something else I'm planning on, Brandon, I didn't even tell you this, but if you have one quick minute, I'm planning an event in Japan, in Tokyo, in early April to help sellers sell into Amazon Japan. So if you're Is interested- Is that going to be just right before Canton? It's going to be before Canton. It's going to be April 4th and 5th. I like literally, this is like the first time I ever announced it publicly. Count me in. Yeah, we, I would love. I've been to wanting have to you. go to Japan. I've been wanting to go to Japan forever. Like Jen- Jennifer and I have been wanting to go, and like, so the in 2020 we had plans to go to Australia for the first time. We finally made it this year. We had plans to go to Europe for the first time and to go to Japan for the first time. Yeah, and then COVID yeah, well, killed everything. So yeah, we uh we were not able to make it. So Japan is still on our list. Finally, just opened up, and then uh, yeah. you know Europe we're still looking to do. So, uh, so, yeah, so Brandon, you're gonna do Japan. Canton and Australia all in one go? It's going to be a lot of traveling. I'm going to see if I can swing by. We would love to have you. Uh, Ted says, I'm in for Japan. I don't have a web page up for that yet, but email me if you want to join the Amazon Japan Mastermind Ted. in Tokyo, April 4th, 5th, 2023. And it's during the cherry blossom season as well. So we will have a, a social Amazing. event underneath the cherry blossom trees in a nice Tokyo park, uh, some sake, some beer, some sushi and good food. Love to have you, Brandon, and uh, welcome. Hope other people can join us as well. Oh, uh, you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get you here, man. Gotta get you here. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Brandon, again. This was an excellent session. I learned a lot. Sure, everyone else did too. So we'll see you guys soon. Have a great one, guys. Great good to night. see everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good day. Bye, guys.